the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day, Wednesday, May 25th. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. Dix sports some pain. The retailer plunging after cutting its forecast due to supply chain issues and high costs. Just the latest company now to warn of the inflation impact. And the Fed tea leaves. Market waits for the Fed minutes, inflation, growth, financial conditions and focus. We ask the question, have yields finally peaked? And worse than 2020, China's premier says the country's economic pain is the worst than two years ago. We're going to talk to world leaders at Davos uh, for their take. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. It, it feels like it's a summer Friday. Like, volume is super light. Hardly any movement yep. in any asset class right now. Because we're about to potentially get the answer to the question that everybody is asking right now. And it's the question that we're asking, Alex. Have yields peaked? Is the Fed about to blink? Should we be pricing out maybe that third 50 basis point hike that the market has got in right now? Let's talk to Emily Rowland, JH Investment Management, Co-Chief Investment Strategist, to try and get an answer to that. Emily, is the Fed going to blink? Have yields peaked? So the answer is yes, we do believe that yields have peaked, and we do believe that the Fed will pause after two 50 point basis point rate hikes in its next two upcoming meetings. We see economic growth clearly decelerating. The leading economic indicators are falling. They're less than 5% year-over-year growth right now. And the Fed is getting the tightening that it wants in terms of financial conditions. Certainly, we've seen asset prices come down. We do think that the Fed will be able to pump the brakes here. And we're seeing a huge opportunity to lean into bonds. We haven't seen yields at this level in a long time. The aggregate bond index at over 3.5%. Remember, just a year ago, we were getting 1.7% on the aggregate bond index. We think this is a great opportunity to add bonds to portfolios as we move through into the late cycle period mm -hmm. and ultimately recession. Yeah, but Emily, I have a hard time thinking that 275 is where the Fed is really happy with the 10-year. I mean, you're still over 3,900 on the S&P. Yes, financial conditions have tightened, but I have to think they want even more now. Yeah, I think so. And, and, you know, for now, the Fed is getting what it wants. And we're seeing that come through in, in data, uh, like the housing market data that we've seen. But there's more work that needs to be done here in terms of figuring out how to dampen inflation. Yes, inflationary pressures are coming off the boil, but they're certainly still here. And there's a couple elements that have kept them elevated. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, clearly oil prices at $110 a barrel. That is not helping the inflation situation or the Fed. And we've seen supply chain issues, of course, be exacerbated here due to the zero COVID policies in China, which have effectively brought economic activity to a halt. So inflation is still here. Uh, it's still elevated. It's not going away. And the Fed has said that it's going to do whatever it, can, it takes to attack inflation. And it needs clear and convincing evidence that inflationary pressures are subsiding in order to be able to pump the brakes on tightening. So we'll need to see. We might get more clues on that in the Fed minutes this afternoon. If the Fed is done, though, if uh, not done, but if, if the Fed is going to signal that it is going to pause, Emily, and maybe we do get that signal today, maybe it's too rearview mirror the minutes to, to, to get to that point, though. Are we in a position where now we need to think about rotating out of value and back into growth? Yeah, certainly. I think, you know, value has been the trade. Uh, you think about the overweight to sectors like energy, and, and, and that's really been, you know, that kind of cyclical element that's helped provide that inflation protection. When we look to the growth side of the house, that's really where you're going to find quality. You're going to find companies with great balance sheets, ones that don't need to tap the capital markets in order to be profitable, good return on equity, good earning stability. You're going to find some more defensive parts of the market on the growth side of the house. And so we really want to think about emphasizing that defensive element in portfolios as we move closer to late cycle. One of our favorite places to think about are areas like utilities and infrastructure type businesses. Consumer behavior is changing away from the things that we want, those discretionary items, to the things that we need. And we think these companies that are going to have that that consistent demand and that consistent income paid out to investors are going to add a lot of value here as, as the cycle progresses very quickly. 
What do you do with tech, though? And I mean, like, high-quality tech, um, the companies yeah. that are definitely going to stick around if yields have peaked. High quality tech is the baby that's been thrown out with the bathwater. And we look at some of these companies that, been, that have been sold off amidst this indiscriminate macro driven selling that we've seen pervade the market so far this year. And there are some high quality tech companies that offer a lot of value right now. On the other hand, it makes sense that some of these unprofitable, more speculative growth names have been sold off. Our theme to start the year was don't get too comfortable in the fast lane, sell your high beta highly cyclical, unprofitable assets that have done so well since the COVID uh, recession ended and start to lean into more defense, start to lean into more quality. Don't abandon stocks, but be really thoughtful about where you're finding those opportunities under the hood. Emily, where do you think the S&P bottoms out? Do you, I'm, I'm curious as to yeah. what the next few weeks is going to bring. And, and, and I know numbers are difficult to kind of get right, but are we... Are we in the process of bottoming here on stocks more broadly? Have we got further to go? We went into the, into the, um, into the pandemic significantly lower than where we are now. We're still elevated from that position. Do you think we need to get down to kind of clear some of those levels out? Or do you think we're kind of done around where we are now? Yeah, I just saw Mike McKee post that great chart on Twitter suggesting that we're still above the levels that we were uh, pre-pandemic. So we could have further to go here. You know, we're looking at a decline of close to 20 percent. If this is a bear market that's associated with the recession, which we're putting about a 50-50 odds on, I know that's not that helpful right now, um, you could see further declines. Average bear markets that come with recession see a decline of 37 percent on average versus non-recessionary bears, which are closer to 27 percent. So we're almost there as far as a non-recessionary bear, but could have further to go. Now, what I would point out is that it's about making trade-offs in terms of relative performance. There's a lot of dislocations in the market right now. If we're starting to think about recession, for example, areas like European value stocks have held up incredibly well. We don't really understand that disconnect. We could see further pain in areas like that. You know, you could see oil prices come down. Energy stocks start to roll over a bit here. Uh, so there are pockets of opportunity, again, on, in companies that have good earnings growth prospects mm -hmm. that can do well in a decelerating growth period. Well, Emily, you may have just answered my question, but I was going to say, if you haven't sold yet, where can you still be selling if someone didn't take your recommendation in the beginning of the year? Yeah, again, those are the areas. It's those more cyclical parts of the market. Um, again, international equities in general, you're going to get a lot more cyclical exposure just because of the relative sector composition. You know, you've benefited from having a lot of energy, a lot of financials. You know, European banks are, are actually moving higher, which is a massive disconnect in terms of this move towards a global recession that we're starting to see here. So we would look to chip away and sell those more highly cyclical, high beta assets and move more into defense here, which is going to be warranted as late cycle uh, dynamics persist. What does the world look like if the Fed does deliver 350 basis point hikes? What does the world look like if Bill Ackman's right and we still need multiple 50 basis point hikes from here, Emily? Yeah, it's a, it's a hard landing. So, you know, the Fed is going to act aggressively here. I think oil plays a key role. If you see commodity and energy prices remain elevated, there is a chance that the Fed is going to need to move forward with more aggressive rate hikes and you see a recession play out. I think the most important thing to consider here is the playbook as far as investing goes. And if you believe that a recession is forthcoming, you believe Ackman and the, 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 the kind of idea here that the Fed is going to move really aggressively, this is a time where you want to embrace bonds. And there is some room here for bonds to rally. Even in a soft landing scenario, if we get that pause in September, which mm -hmm. Fed funds futures are starting to price in, you still want to embrace bonds because so much tightening has already been priced into the yield curve. The bond market is pricing in 11 quarter uh, basis point rate hikes right now. So that means that if you think the bond yields are going to go up based on Fed policy, you have to believe that the Fed is going to raise rates more than 11 times. And we're taking the under on that right now, which means that bonds are going to op offer opportunity either way. Well, the bond market seems to be supporting you uh, so far this week. Emily, before we let you go, I just wanted to get your take on earnings because you talk very clearly about sort of the inflation scare becoming a growth scare. And that's what we saw in the likes of like a Walmart, Target, Dick's, for example, Ross stores. And I'm wondering in terms of earnings, have we re-rated enough to account for that? 
No. In fact, we look at next 12 month earnings growth in the U.S. and it's actually still picking up. So we haven't really seen that re-rating in, in expectations as far as earnings growth. And I think if we do start to see earnings estimates rolling over and reflecting some of these concerns, you could see a further down leg in stocks here. I do want to point out, though, that the retailers are a pretty small part of the market. So again, back to that conversation around technology, that's going to be a really critical piece here is when you own the U.S. equity market, you own a lot of technology companies. And I think the fate of those companies is going to be critical. And it's one area, again, that we see the most earnings stability and the best earnings growth prospects into next year. Emily, it was really good to catch up. Really great perspective. Yeah. Emily Rowland, JH Investment Co. Chief Investment Strategist. All right, coming up, we're going to head back to Davos. Saudi Arabia has planned to overhaul its economy front and center. We're going to get the latest from uh, Khalid Al Falah, the Saudi Investment Minister. He'll be joining us from Davos. This is Bloomberg. We don't have a lot of spare capacity. Spare capacity is 2% or lower. In a market of 100 million barrels, that is very low. Right now it is uh, going down and it's uh, quickly as OPEC and OPEC Plus releasing 400,000 every month. So very soon you have a world that 100 million barrels or more with basically no spare capacity. That was Saudi Ramco CEO Amin Nassar speaking earlier with Bloomberg Television at the World Economic Forum. And we want to go back to Davos now, where Bloomberg's has Linda Amin is with Saudi Arabia's investment minister. Well, Alex, joining me is Khalid al Fali, Saudi Arabia's investment minister. Uh, minister, good to have you with us. We heard about uh, Aramco talking about capacity. We know that you're trying to build your capacity, oil capacity, that is. Uh, what are the plans? And are you open, perhaps, to attracting foreign investors to directly invest in those projects? Well, thank you, Aslan. A pleasure to be with you. First of all, let me say we're open to investment in Saudi Arabia across the board. Saudi Arabia is doing better than ever. We're coming out of, uh, of the pandemic, of multiple crises that has hit the world, hit the region, uh, not just the health crisis, the economic crisis, but two oil shocks on supply and demand, and in addition to the regional challenges stronger than ever. Our uh, delivery against uh, Vision 2030 is ahead uh, of schedule, and I can cite uh, a number of metrics that we have uh, we have exceeded, but our uh, commitment to 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 the energy sector is consistent with our uh, policy over many many decades. The kingdom has and will continue to be, mm. uh, you know, a key anchor for the global economy in terms of delivering reliable, affordable, predictable uh, sources of energy, oil and gas. Gas will be expanded significantly, as I'm sure you've heard from my colleagues in the energy sector and, and the oil capacity, which is being tested today as, as, as we experience some supply shortages, is also going to be uh, expanded. But I'll let His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz. Uh, Just to be sure, Minister, you're saying that you're open to foreign investors investing directly in those projects. Across the board in all sectors, I said, oil and gas remains the purview of Saudi Aramco. How much, interest? How much Aramco. interest are you are you seeing right now? Who's we're, expressed interest? We're, in we're obviously seeing a lot of interest in renewables. Uh, we, we've seen investments in in, uh, in in power generation coming out of solar, coming out of wind. We've seen it in hydrogen, and 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 those those projects are well advanced, and there are leading global companies teaming with with leading uh, Saudi company. Uh, the oil services sector is booming in Saudi Arabia, and there are many global companies that have moved to Saudi Arabia and invested with Aramco in the oil uh, supply chain. But in terms of investments in gas, for example, I leave that for my colleagues in, uh, uh, in, in, in the energy sector to sp you know, speak specifically. We know Aramco can, can do the entire, uh, entire thing by themselves. And, and that's up to them whether they and they have the concession, of course, exclusively. Uh, but I'll leave it up to them if they if they choose to bring in any investment. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been looking to diversify its economy. You want to expand your EV space in particular. Uh, how is it coming along? What are the targets? 
Well, as I mentioned, we're, uh, we're committed to the energy transition, both on the supply and demand side. On the supply side, I spoke you know, uh, about opening up uh, our abundant resources of uh, sunshine, of wind, of ample uh, land, of an infrastructure uh, that, that can allow us to develop those projects at the lowest cost. And today, both wind and solar in Saudi Arabia are setting a global record, and the same thing with hydrogen, with the electrolyzers, accessing But for EV manufacturing, apart from yeah, Lucid, so, so that's on the supply. Who, are, who are you in touch with? On, who on, are you speaking to? Uh, on, on, on the demand side, of course, we are activating demand for, uh, for, for uh, renewable energy, whether it's in digital, whether it's in mobility. And you mentioned EV manufacturing. Yes, we've already broke ground on our first uh, EV assembly plant. It's a significant one, 150,000 at the top of, uh, of the ladder in terms of the quality and the price range of EV with Lucid. We're talking to at least two other, three other uh, manufacturers. I am not at liberty because we're under NDA, but, but they come from three different... Uh, when do you think you can make the announcement then? If you're not... we're, we're hoping to make the announcements this year on, on all three. So th this is happening rapidly. Uh, and in addition to the assembly plants, to the OEMs choosing Saudi Arabia as their supply, as their location to be a global supplier, we're developing the entire value chain for EV manufacturing, from manufacturing components to research and development, to uh, material, you know, base material compounding, uh, to to talent, uh, you know, for 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 Saudi Arabia to be the most competitive location for EV, to of course batteries uh, and mineral materials feeding EV batteries. So big plans to attract foreign investors into Saudi Arabia. Give us a sense of where you are in terms of of your FDI target for the year. We know that for last year, for instance. Uh, you know, you saw, I guess, decade high FDI because of the Aramco deal. How is it looking for 2022? Well, for 2021, we exceeded uh, our target. We started from a low position, less than $5 billion at the beginning of the vision. Uh, uh, last year, we, we hit, uh, we quadrupled that. So, so we're approaching. $20 billion in terms of our FDI, FDI. And yes, the Aramco pipeline contributed. But even without the Aramco pipeline, we'd, we would have exceeded uh, our target for 21. Uh, and we see the trend continuing. Uh, you know, the, the oil and gas energy sector will continue to be key to Saudi Arabia, to the region. We are uh, endowed, like I mentioned, with abundant resources. Petrochemicals will grow as more molecules from our natural resources are converted into petrochemical materials, increasingly durable materials that are used for sustainability to displace uh, metals uh, into the manufacturing, into the construction mm -hmm. uh, space. So, uh, but, but we're seeing new sectors attract a lot of FDI, sectors that you would, would not Such as? have associated with Saudi Arabia. Well, tourism is a big sector uh, for the kingdom. Uh, and, and we're, we're uh, you know, again, quadrupling uh, the, the number of visitors that we're attracting uh, to the kingdom. Not only religious tourism, which we're proud of uh, as, right. as the country that, 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 uh, that, that has Mecca and Medina, but also cultural tourism, tourism into our, uh, you know, archaeological site yet uh, undiscovered, as well as discovering our heritage our people, our culture, our values. I want to talk to you, Minister, about the free zones, the SEZ. Give us an update on that. Well, we, we have uh, four zones that have reached an advanced stage of uh, structuring their value proposition. They will include logistics. They will include unique manufacturing uh, value chains in them, uh, both in the East Coast and the West Coast of Saudi Arabia. There will be one around financial services and to host regional headquarters uh, from around the world uh, in the capital uh, city of Riyadh. There will be some in tech hosting cloud computing and, and uh, high value technology sectors to be attracted to the kingdom, given access to talent, access to incentives. Uh, and, and an ecosystem that allows them to compete globally. But in terms of investments, can you quantify that? I mean, what will that translate to? As I mentioned earlier, our targets are ambitious. By 2030, we're going to attract annually uh, over $100 billion of annual flows of FDI. 
And of course, this will be coupled with significant domestic investment, investment from the PIF, from, from uh, leading Saudi companies, as well as from the Saudi private sector. So the size of Saudi investment will be large. We believe, we believe that the special economic zones will contribute something like 20% of the total uh, investment flows, but it will be more catalyzing this sector and not limiting investments from the base economy. The base economy will continue to be, you know, the platform on which right. most of the investments will go to. Minister, just one final question before we let you go. Some speculation that perhaps you allow alcohol in some of these uh, economic zones. Uh, can you clarify that? Any, any you know, I think you mentioned it's speculation. Uh, there is no policy change uh, in Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Ar Arabia is firmly committed to its values, to the wishes uh, of its population, and we're proud of uh, being, as I mentioned, uh, the hosts of Mecca and Medina, the two holy sites for Muslims. And also we know that our population is also proud of our heritage, our religion. We believe our proposition uh, our, our quality of life is still very, very competitive without uh, introducing uh, alcohol into our country. Minister al -Fali, we thank you so much for your insights today. There you have it, Guy. Handing it back to you. Haslinda, thank you very much indeed. Haslinda Amin with Saudi Arabia's investment minister in Davos. We'll be back to Davos very shortly. Much more ahead. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash to look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Ritika Gupta. Pfizer plans to sell its entire portfolio of brand name drugs at cost in as many as 45 lower income countries. It's one of the most ambitious drug access programs ever announced by a large pharmaceutical manufacturer. The initiative will start in five African countries with 23 drugs for cancer, rare illnesses and other conditions. Two internal candidates are emerging at Societe Generale to replace CEO Frederick Odea, who is stepping down after 14 years. Salma Krupa has been running Stockton's investment bank from New York for more than a year. He's been at the bank for more than two decades and has a harsh managerial style. Sebastian Proto runs Stockton's domestic bank and has elite credentials. The CEO search will go on till the fall. And that is your latest business flash, Guy. Rudika, thank you very much indeed. Coming up. Ireland's foreign minister says it's up to the UK to move away from, quote, unrealistic demands on the Northern Ireland Protocol. We're going to discuss that. Michael Martin, the Taoiseach, is next. This is Bloomberg. A lot of turbulence in current markets, that shouldn't put us off our mission, which is actually to provide stable returns no. over the longer term. And it's really inflation, which would probably be the one we're watching the most. We are an hour into the U.S. trading session. You're looking at stocks right around the highs of the session. The S&P up by 7 tenths of 1%. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking those moves. Hey, Abigail. Hey, Alex. Well, another day of whipsaws. We now have that S&P 500 up 7 tenths of 1%, as you were just mentioning earlier, down about 3 to 4 tenths of 1%. So the intraday volatility that we have seen in recent days, weeks, months, this year, really, it is continuing today, but to the upside. And you can see that the NASDAQ 100 doing even better, up 1%, perhaps uh, confirmed by the idea that it's a risk on day. Yesterday was risk off when you had stocks lower and bonds higher. But today bonds down just a little bit. That 10 year yield up one basis point. And you can see that the VIX holding steady below 30. So again, there's a little bit of a risk on mood here for uh, stocks and risk assets. Now, relative to that recent trading I was talking about, the NASDAQ 100 may be higher on the day, but in the month of May, it's pretty rough, down 7.5%. That, of course, after a very difficult April. And you can see the movement down and then this intraday chop. Right now, from a technical standpoint, what you would want to see if you were bullish is to have that last high taken out on uh, the 17th, 18th in there. And then maybe you could have some sort of a near-term bottom that would support at least uh, a near-term move up. Again, the downtrend on the year is pretty severe. Plus, while we do have big tech higher today, including Apple holding support and Amazon and the like, Amazon is on the cusp of perhaps moving, missing, losing its uh, one trillion market cap mark. Here is uh, a chart of this, and you can see that Amazon uh, back in 2020 above that one trillion dollar mark 
almost at $2 trillion, quite frankly, for much of last year. Right now, right there on the cusp. That would clearly suggest, if that happens, that maybe the NASDAQ 100 is not going to make out that last high and that this downtrend will continue. Speaking of movement, the retail sector always on the move. We have our earnings actually starting out with Toll Brothers up 6.8%. Uh, the luxury home builder, they put up a very strong quarter. They did talk about softening demand for the third quarter. That would be in line with the new home sales yesterday, which disappointed Guy, as you know. Uh, but nonetheless, investors like it today. Nordstrom, the high-end shopper out and about. Sales uh, beat by 6%. They raised the outlooks, so lots of strength there. And then Kohl's, a nice bid there, up 13.4%. They, of course, had a disastrous quarter in outlook, but that is leading some to think that there could be a buyout there. So you see some possible speculative buyout surge there for Kohl's, up 13%, Guy. Abigail, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle on what's happening in the markets. Let's return now to Davos. Heslinda Armin is with the Irish Prime Minister, Michael Martin. Over to you, Heslinda. Well, it is uh, Michal Martin, the Irish Prime Minister, with me. Prime Minister, good to have you with us. It is still about the dispute over Northern Ireland protocol. We currently have a U.S. delegation in Europe. Some say it's more symbolic than significant. What's your take on it? No, it's much more than symbolic because the U.S. involvement in the peace process in Ireland has been one of significant substance over the last number of decades. And when someone of the experience of Richie Neal, uh, chairman of the Ways and Means uh, Committee of, of the House, leads that bipartisan delegation, both Republicans and Democrats, both to Brussels, to London, uh, and to Dublin. That is significant, particularly given the desire of the United Kingdom government to have a, a trade deal with the United States. Uh, and also the genuine desire of, of the US and, um, and these representatives that the Good Friday Agreement would be enhanced, not undermined, um, and that the carefully calibrated work that has been done in respect of the design of the protocol uh, would be upheld. Now, uh, we had good discussions with, I had good discussions with them during the week. I mean, they do understand the need uh, to uh, work on the operation of the protocol, but the trade representatives and those with experience of trade on that delegation really couldn't see anything that couldn't be resolved in terms of the technicalities around the protocol and the issues around the operation of it between the UK government and the European Union, which I thought was quite helpful. But realistically, what can be achieved? What is the best case scenario? What's the worst case scenario for you, given that it was signed in 2019 and here we are still in dispute? The, the, the best case scenario is for the United Kingdom government to engage in intensive negotiations with the European Union with a view to bringing about a resolution to these issues. Disputes of this kind need a will to resolve them. I've questioned myself whether that will exists, uh, particularly within the United Kingdom government for quite some time, because when I met with the European Union Vice President uh, last year, I asked him to go to Northern Ireland, meet all the parties, listen, uh, and come back with, with new proposals. He did all of that. Last October came forward with a significant set of proposals, but it was not reciprocated by the UK government at the time. Now, there's been changes and so on in terms of the negotiation team. This trust is now in, 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 in charge. Uh, so in my view, UK government hasn't given that process a chance. And we're concerned as to whether there are different agendas at play uh, or whether the UK government really wants to settle this, because I don't see the landing zone for the UK government. They're not clear what would resolve this. I, I am clear about politicians in Northern Ireland. I have a fair idea where the unionist politicians mm. are, you know, their concerns and where they would like to land this, particularly goods going from UK to Northern Ireland. I think if the technocrats were allowed to engage, uh, people from industry as well should be given a voice at the table because we met them recently. They're, they're saying to us, the protocol is working for manufacturing. It's working for the meat industry. It's working for the dairy industry. There are smaller sectors where it's not working. Uh, optimally for them, uh, and therefore they have the know-how and the expertise, minus the politics, mm. to resolve genuine outstanding issues that are there. Minister, in your view, is the UK acting in good faith? I mean, when it signed the protocol back in 2019, do you think the UK knew exactly what, were, what they were signing up to? Well, I think, it, uh, oh yes, they knew exactly what they were signing up to, and in fact, all the documentation would attest to that. I mean, the implications of Brexit were spelt out, but also the implications of the protocol. And it was the British Prime Minister who recommended uh, the protocol and the trade agreement to the United Kingdom Parliament, which then subsequently ratified the international treaty with the European Union. And 
it's the UK government really has decided now to um, indicate that they're now contemplating uh, reneging and uh, undermining that international treaty um, unilaterally. Now, that's not how democracies and, and countries of like mind normally behave. And I would appeal to the UK government uh, that to engage with the European Union. They have said, to be fair, that they are willing to engage, but they've now put another sort of demand on the table that if we don't get our way, we're going to go ahead with this legislation anyway. And that's not how we normally engage. In you said before government. that all options are on the table. What are you referring to? And is a renegotiation even an option? No. Uh, when, I, when I referenced uh, renegotiation, that was in the context of the European Union response to the United Kingdom unilater unilaterally enacting legislation to um, get rid and tear up the agreement that they'd entered into with the European Union. The European Union are saying all options remain on the table in terms of how the European Union would respond to the United Kingdom if that eventuality happened. Of course, we don't want to go near there. We're just all experiencing uh, these number of days, talking to representatives from the Ukrainian government, for example. There's a terrible war on the people of Ukraine, which is affecting all of Europe. The United Kingdom has led well on the Ukrainian war. I give credit to the United Kingdom government for their leadership in that respect. But geopolitically, UK, Ireland, the United States should be in alignment on the big issues. These issues should not be the subject matter of the dispute of this kind. They can be resolved. I'm certain of that. I know the detail of this. The detail of this can be resolved if there is a will on all sides to resolve it. And I would appeal to the British government to really engage with the European Union and through the Vice President Mara Sefcovic, who has been extremely flexible in respect of this issue. Can it be resolved before you leave office in December? How well, optimistic are you? I'll still be in government in, 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 <laughs> in, in, in December, but uh, as Leaving you know, we, have, we have an arrangement yes. to, to, with, with, with our coalition party. Uh, it can, of course, be resolved. Um, before Christmas. It comes back to that issue of if there's a will there, it certainly can be, because the issues themselves are not of a kind that should prevent resolution. That's my genuine view, if there's honest engagement on all sides. Uh, and that is the wish of all in, in, at European Union level um, also. They have no desire for further disruption or for further trouble. Mm. We have enough challenges. We've just come out of COVID-19, or the emergency phase of COVID-19, where Europe has responded very well. We now have this terrible war uh, in, in relation to Ukraine. We have significant cost of living issues uh, and economic issues. We don't need this dispute. Some say that perhaps if talks fail, there could be a trade war between the EU and UK. What are the prospects of that? And... Well, unilateralism by one party can create that uh, response, um, but nobody wants that. Um, and um, so that, that's down the line, but that's something that we do not want to contemplate. At the time of COP26 last year, we again had a similar uh, moment like this, where I think Britain pulled back somewhat from some of what it was threatening to do at that time. Um, and that's becoming frustrating for member states within the European Union and for the Commission, uh, that we have this stop-start uh, approach to the engagement, and that we have these kind of um, threats of unilateral action from time to time. And that's not conducive to um, a constructive resolution of the issues. Prime Minister, we know that Europe is trying to cut its reliance on Russian oil and gas, and of course uh, Ireland is doing the same, but in that transition to renewables, you're also, I guess, coming across high prices. In fact, that transition could cost you 30% more. Is that impacting your transition to renewables? No, I mean, our fundamental challenge in terms of moving to renewables uh, will be structural delivery, planning, and we're working on that. We've now created a streamlined planning framework for offshore wind development in Ireland. I mean, for the next decade, the big investment in Ireland will be offshore wind. We're one of the windiest uh, sea coasts in Ireland, particularly in the western seaboard, um, in the world. So wind is Ireland's oil, and that's how we're going to play it for the long term. And certainly by the mid-2030s, we want to be exporting um, energy, and that's our ambition. Uh, and what the war in Ukraine is teaching us and indeed the rest of Europe. And when President von der Leyen puts the graphs up on the wall, there's only one journey here. It's a journey towards renewables. Uh, and we're going to have to double down on that, notwithstanding the enormous pressures at the moment on the, the prices around fossil fuels and so on and energy issues. I think this is a watershed, actually, in the transition from uh, fossil fuels 
to renewables. And I actually see an acceleration and a lessening of the dependency um, on oil and gas. This war is also causing escalating inflation and it's costing uh, your people a lot of grief. There is a cost, uh, I guess, crisis right now. Is it about to get worse before it gets better? I think it will be very challenging to the end of the year and probably will get worse to the end of the year. But again, uh, you know, various governments are taking measures to ease the pressure on people. But the war is having an impact and uh, the war has many uh, facets to it. I mean, uh, Putin knows what he's doing in terms of the, creating the, the terror in Ukraine that's led to a huge humanitarian crisis, the worst since World War II, an energy crisis, and now significantly a food crisis, uh, potentially famine. When you combine the absence of exports from Ukraine um, in terms of grain and so on with other droughts in the Horn of Africa and so on, we're facing very difficult scenarios internationally and globally into the future. But we've got to hold the line because what's at stake here is our fundamental values of democracy, of freedom of speech, free media. Uh, and I, I, I genuinely believe in what President Biden says, uh, that there is uh, a very significant challenge ahead of us between those of us of like-minded states, democracies who cherish these values versus the authoritarian regimes, and those who want to really snuff out free media, uh, who want to undermine um, the contrarian view within society, mm. freedom of, 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 of opinion. These are, something, these are values that can be taken from us uh, by authoritarian leaders more quickly than perhaps we might uh, think. And therefore, uh, we, you know, what I'm saying basically to our peoples, uh, we didn't want this war, but nonetheless the consequences of it will be felt by all of us in all societies in Europe. But we, once we have the clear vision as to why we're taking the stance we're taking, um, then I think people will, will, will wear that and, 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 and take it on board and, 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 and put the shoulder to the wheel uh, to make sure we can uh, absorb these pressures and come out the other side stronger and better right. for it. Prime Minister Michal Martin, we thank you so much for your time today. Of course, we're coming to you live from the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Guy, back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Haslinda. Now, while Haslinda was speaking to the Taoiseach there, the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has been fielding questions at a press conference at 10 Downing Street in London, not related to the Irish Protocol, but related to the publication today of the Sue Gray report into the Partygate saga. The Prime Minister is continuing to answer those questions. Let's take a listen to what he's saying. Of a kind that we'd never seen before, uh, or certainly not in my lifetime. Uh, its effects were, were unknowable, and all the medical and scientific advice was that you had to proceed by non-pharmaceutical interventions. You had to get people uh, to behave according to certain uh, rules. So I don't think the floor was with the with the rules, Tom. Uh, I, I've got to, you know, it, it, we should have we should have recognised that the boundary between work events and uh, and socialising for people who are continuously working together in the same place uh, was going to be hard to draw, and we should have we sh we, we you know things should have been done differently, and they, and they certainly are being done differently uh, fr from now on. O on your point about incomes, uh, which is the crucial thing, and, and look, you know, the, the COVID pandemic cost the government a, a huge, it cost taxpayers $408 billion just to uh, support businesses and support families uh, th through the pandemic. It, it's left a very difficult uh, fiscal position. Employment is very strong. Some features of our, of, of our economy are, are, are extremely strong. But there's no doubt, because of the, the global supply chain shocks, uh, uh, exacerbated what, by, what, uh, what, by what Putin has done in, in Ukraine, uh, by the, uh, the, the spike in the price of energy, uh, we're going to see pressures for a while to come. I've just got to be realistic with people about that. We're going to see pressures on, uh, on household finances. So what I'm saying to people is that we will uh, continue to respond just as we responded uh, throughout the, the pandemic. These, it won't be easy. We won't be able to, to fix everything. But what I would also say is that we will get through it and, uh, and we will get through it well. And uh, the, we have... The British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, speaking at 10 Downing Street. Uh, the bulk of the questions on what is happening uh, as a result of the Grey report. Uh, but nevertheless, the Prime Minister there addressing the issue of the cost of living squeeze. There is an expectation, possibly by the end of the week, that we could hear from his Chancellor in terms of providing further assistance for the British public. Coming up, Twitter's annual shareholder meeting kicks off in around two hours. But the question on most shareholders' minds is not even on the agenda. What's the latest detail? on Elon Musk's offer.
We're going to go to California next to try and get an answer. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishka Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Zafrul Abdul Aziz, Malaysia's finance minister, joining Bloomberg Television, 11 a.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. One corporate event you definitely want to watch today is Twitter. It's holding its annual shareholder meeting. It's kicking off at 1 p.m. New York time. And obviously the big question on everyone's mind is the potential sale to Elon Musk. Now, one of the Twitter's founders said this morning that this meeting could be one for the books. This sort of feels like the Ragnarok of Twitter annual meetings where there's there's only sort of one option that shareholders are looking for, which is to know that the deal is going to go through because now the deal price looks like this amazing deal and the rest of the world has melted down. And I think the questions are just going to be, can I get my money now? All right, joining us now is Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, who is outside Twitter's headquarters in, France, in San Francisco. Uh, Ed, the Twitter stock, 36.42, up by 2% today. That is a far right. cry from the ask price, uh, the original ask price from Elon Musk. What are we looking for today? Yeah, I mean, whether you're a shareholder or you're a merger arbitrage specialist, there's a number of scenarios and outcomes that we're trying to discern, right? And, and Elon Musk's bid to buy the company isn't even on the agenda. But you have CEO Parag Agrawal, CFO Ned Siegel participating in a Q&A. And so you'd imagine, of course, they'll be asked. You know, on one hand, I think there's acceptance that $54.20 per share, the current bid, just isn't going to happen. But you're also trying to calculate an outcome where the, the deal doesn't happen at all. Elon Musk, of course, as you guys know, says that it's on hold until he gets more information about the percentage of users on the platform that are bots. But somewhere in between an outcome where there's no deal and trying to price that and $54.20 a share is a price more reflective of what we've seen in markets recently. And of course, Twitter was a late seller in the in the in basically the tech bear market we saw in recent weeks and months and has seen further pressure because of snaps revision to its guidance for the year. So is there going to be a deal? But also, does Elon Musk come back in with a lower price? Yeah. What, OK, to that point, Ed, what does on hold mean? What do people think on hold means right now? Yeah, so you'll remember last week that we reported at Bloomberg there was a, a all-hands meeting at Twitter. Uh, Vijay Gade, who's the sort of chief legal officer at Twitter, told employees in that meeting there is no such thing, quote, as a deal on hold. We've spoken to M&A lawyers. We've spoken to M&A bankers. Once you've signed that deal, a deal isn't on hold. Yes, you could come back in and renegotiate at a lower price point, make a renewed offer, but you can't just put it on pause. So this is classic Elon Musk, right? Go going to Twitter, mm -hmm. stating his side of the story, but us not having a mechanism to ask him more about it. Um, Ed, this might be an unfair question, but the vibe there, I mean, do shareholders want this to go through? Like, are they into this deal? Well, I just think back to that fantastic Jason Goldman quote about Ragnarok, right? Norse mythology, the end of the world as we know it. $54.20 a share seems an unbelievable offer right now. Put yourself in the shoes of the shareholder and that outcome versus the worst case scenario. You'd probably take it right. But I think there is a concern that whatever happens, Twitter has to change. Elon Musk has talked about moving from an ad based model to a subscription model. Well, the world has changed overnight, right? We're thinking about advertising models in the in the macro environment that we're currently living in with. Something kind of has to give. And that's what I'm hearing not only from Twitter shareholders, but insiders as well who are trying to get to work on a product. These are product engineers who have been working on something for some time and they're worried that if Elon Musk comes in, they'll have to pivot in a dramatically different direction. How did Snap change that equation, Ed? I the, the Snap story was about the macro, the advertising slowdown. Yeah. That was a shock for a lot of people. It, it was a shock for two reasons. One, they gave a pretty bullish forecast very recently about their user base. But we forget, don't worry about users. Advertising is not beholden to the user level and the growth in that metric. It's about the confidence of the consumer and the confidence of advertisers. And quite clearly, that is shot based on what's going on in the global economy. Great stuff, Ed. Thank you very much indeed. Ed Ludlow joining us from San Francisco outside the Twitter meeting. This is Bloomberg. Coming up, the European close quick.
Check on the price action. Stocks appeared. We're up by around eight tenths of one percent. We're waiting for the Fed. Euro dollar a little softer today, at quite critical levels, I think, judging by the charts. A little bit of a softer language coming out from a number of Fed speakers today. Uh, so dovish down. Brent crude though a little bit. We're trading one fourteen right now. It's plenty to talk about when it comes to the crude market. Timothy Ash of Blue Bay Asset Management joining us next. We're going to talk more about Russia as well. This is Bloomberg.